his perfect, innocent son and treat him like the worst sinner. But also beauty, because the Lord Jesus did that. He went there willingly for us. And now with the eyes of faith, I can see my dying Savior and know he was there suffering for me to bring me his heaven. <laughs> yellow was about cleanliness. And so I told you about the bright yellow sunlight soap that I bought and how when you wash your hands with it, it's all clean and smells so fresh and lemony. And we talked about how the cross then is like a cosmic laundry where anyone regardless of what they've done, where they've been, what your background is, by repentance and faith can wash themselves from every stain and all the shame of sin. Now I've got four more colors for you this morning. The next one, red, orange, yellow, green. Green is the color for military. You think of the US Special Forces or the Green Berets. And the next thing I want to say about the cross is that it was a great commando raid. In October 2015, 70 Iraqi prisoners were being held in a school that ISIS had converted into a prison. And they were waiting to be killed and piled into a mass grave. But that night, Kurdish troops and Green Berets stormed into the school defeated the captors and released the prisoners. Now nobody here is naive enough to think that they're a perfect person. All of us know that we get things wrong, that we think things, we do things, we say things that aren't pure and aren't good. There are things that go on in our heads and in our hearts that if other people could see what was happening there, we'd be absolutely devastated that they know what we're really like. The Bible calls these things sin. They're the, the symptoms of a problem we have with our hearts called sin. And the Bible's real about how comprehensively sin has permeated our world. All have sinned. It says all Without exception, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now what you might not know is that sin imprisons us. Sin makes chains which keep us from God. They lock us up in the kingdom of sin under the watch of the Lord of sin, Satan. Now the devil has one plan for us. His only intent is to keep us locked up in sin until it's too late for us to escape and all we have left is execution. He wants you a prisoner in this life and stuck suffering then the eternal death of hell. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says of him. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks of his own character. It's saying that when the devil lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And so there couldn't be a worse prison guard that could have us chained up. His only intent is for those he's guarding is, is death. And he, until he accomplishes that, his every word, every twig of hope, every little olive branch that he offers is a lie. He'll tell you you're going to be free or you already are free. Don't worry about where you're at. And it's false. He's the Lord of disappointment, despair and death. He makes iron chains out of shame and guilt and fear and addiction. And all of us are born his prisoners. In North Korea, enemies of the state are, are punished for generations. One person commits the crime and their children and grandchildren suffer too. And so there are children who grow up in camps with no experience, no knowledge of life beyond the fence. Well, that's what it's like for me and you, born into sin. It's why we find it impossible to break free, because we don't even know that there's life outside of what we've experienced. Our only hope is that somebody comes from outside to rescue us. Now you think about what the Lord Jesus said. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, I have come that they may have life and life to the full. 
Jesus is saying, that's what I came to bring. And for 30 years, I walked on this earth. And for three, I spoke all about it. And then at last, this great, incisive commando raid into Satan's kingdom. Colossians 1, 13, we read earlier. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see what that's saying? God looked at our situation. He saw us in Satan's domain and in love sent his son to defeat Satan, to break the gates of his kingdom and to bring the prisoners out. But the cross doesn't look like much of a victory, does it? In fact, if we look at the cross, it looks like Satan won the day. Recently, Conor McGregor, the cage fighter, had a big boxing match with Floyd Mayweather Jr., who's a professional boxer. He's now gone 50 and all, 50 bouts. He's won every single one of them. For nine rounds, Mayweather just soaked up everything McGregor had. And so McGregor's just punching away, and if you would have looked in at round number five, you'd have thought he's going to win. There's going to be a massive upset because McGregor's just throwing punches and all Mayweather's doing is keeping his guard up. Nothing's going on. And then round 10, when Mayweather's soaked everything up and McGregor's just so exhausted he can hardly lift his arms anymore. Mayweather knocks him out. On the cross, hell did everything it could to Jesus. Satan sees God the Son weak and vulnerable and so he unleashes everything he has. His time has come. This is his opportunity to do some damage. He gives everything he can. Jesus breathes his last and it looks to all the world like darkness has won. But three days later, Christ rose and the true victor is emerged. We look into it at round five and Christ is on the cross and it looks like he's going to lose. It looks like it's all over. But we move to round 10 and we see who the real victor is. And while Satan and his demons are all exhausted from having given every drop of hatred and every drop of strength they had and done all they could to Christ, Jesus stands and walks from the grave, victorious over sin and death, leading out the prisoners that hell is now powerless to hold. And so my old pastor says it this way, all the created strength of the powers of darkness matched themselves against the uncreated might of God. And he made them look fools. Or as we read earlier, Colossians 2.15. Listen to it this way. It's exactly what it's saying. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. The embarrassment for hell that it exhausts everything at, at the weak vulnerable human Jesus and yet still he walks out of the grave and he's the victor he puts them to open shame triumphing over them by his cross the cross is a great victory over Satan's kingdom. It's this commando raid. And so Charles Wesley, who wrote so many of our hymns, says this. Long my imprisoned spirit lay. He knew what it was like. He knew as a human being what it meant to be trapped and enchained by sin. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Then he says, thine eye diffused a quickening ray, which is really old poetic language that we kind of sing and we don't really understand what we're saying. So let me explain it really quickly. He's saying, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. So you looked at me. He's saying, I couldn't save myself. Help had to come from outside and it came from you. This is very Calvinistic theology for an Arminian man. But he's saying, God looked my way and his eye diffused a quickening ray. What happened when God looked at me? He worked faith in my heart. Quickening means life where there was no life before. He brought life. And then he says, I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. I walked out of this dungeon after the Lord Jesus. 
I'm saying to you, first of all, as we think about this color green and this cross being a command or raid to rescue our souls from the kingdom of Satan, that he is the hero of our souls, this Lord Jesus. He has broken in, he has torn the bars of your self-made sin prison. And now this is the bit that scares me and frightens me as I'm preparing. Some of you are still refusing to leave. That Jesus has done all of this. And you still won't come out. When Socrates was waiting for execution, some of his friends broke into the prison. They'd bribed or blackmailed the guards. They opened the door and said, we can get you out of here. And Socrates refused to leave. He said, wherever I go, it's just going to happen again. And so he stayed. The Lord Jesus has made a way for you to escape the consequences of sin, to escape hell. He's opened the door. The chains can be gone. The lock is broke. Are you still going to refuse to come out? Hebrews 2, 3 asks the question, how will we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? If we turn our noses up at what Jesus has done, how else are we going to get out of the hell that we deserve? The next color is blue. And I want you to think of the cross as a slave market. When Europeans first came to, to Africa, they hired locals to round up slaves for them to trade with and European money didn't mean anything to the Africans and so instead they swapped their brothers and sisters for little glass blue beads and so I want you to think of blue as that price being paid for a slave a price was paid to rescue you 1 Peter 1:18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but, this is what God gave now, to rescue you, to ransom you, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. See, it's not glass beads that God has given to bring you out of slavery to sin. Neither is it silver nor gold, but the one thing that is worth more than everything in the universe combined, he poured out the blood of his son. I want you to stretch your emotions now. Let the truth in your head reach your heart and affect you because this can't enter your ears and not affect you in terms of joy. Jesus' blood is that key that unlocks the chains that bound us to death and hell. And it's that blood that has bought your freedom. We can't talk about that, about this great condescension of Jesus in allowing his blood to be spilt to save us without affecting us with joy. It's why we sing things like, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Or we should have sung this morning, the price is paid. Come, let us enter into all that Jesus died to make our own. Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. 10,000, thousand are their cries, but all their joys are one. What's their one joy? Worthy the Lamb who died, they cry, to be exalted thus. Worthy the Lamb, our lips reply. For he was slain for us. Jesus is worthy to receive honor and power divine and blessings more than we can give. And to adore the Lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Or how about this one that we all know so well after the last 20 years? No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. What power? Well, it's the legal power of heaven's court that says I am legally no longer bound to sin and its consequences because I've been purchased at a price and I've been bought over into God's kingdom by Jesus' blood. Now, if ever there was a Christian who knew about slaves, it was John Newton. 
because he spent a large part of his life buying and selling slaves before he became a Christian through that African-American corridor. You know he wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. But we don't sing these verses, I want you to listen to them. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience owned and felt the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had shed and helped to nail him there. Alas, I did not, I, alas, I knew not what I did. But all my tears were vain. Where could my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, had slain. A second look he gave which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for your ransom paid. I died that thou mayst live. The next color is indigo. It's that deep blue. And our house down the road is filled up with blue stuff recently because we've had a baby boy. And I want you to think of blue and sonship. And the cross now, see it? A commando raid. A price paid. And now is a certificate of adoption. Hebrews 2.9 We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And so this verse is telling us that that cross, what was it about? It was about bringing many sons to glory. And so those slaves that are bought out of Satan's kingdom are made sons in the mercy and grace of God. Now when the Bible says sons, you know it's not excluding ladies. This isn't about sex, it's about status. It's saying that when Jesus saves you, he gives you all of the rights and the privileges of sonship, of belonging to the royal family of heaven. So Romans 8.15 says, The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. There's this richness then to the Christian faith that you can't find anywhere else. That, as, as my dad was saying to the children earlier, we might call this God Father. But how do I know that I'm God's child? I remember watching a YouTube video, and apparently there's loads of them. It's Christmas time, and this kid's been opening his presents, just surrounded by all these toys and things that he's wanted, and he's got a massive smile on his face. And then mum pulls out this one last present, and it's you know, A4 and, and flat. It's the kind of present that I would have seen at Christmas time and got out the way really quickly early on <laughs> and then saved the good things for later. But she brings out this present and, and he opens it. And he's reading it and looking at it and he, he starts crying. And he runs over to his mum and dad and, and hugs them both because he's been living with this family for a while but he's not their biological child but they've got him adopted. And this certificate now framed for him is telling him he belongs to this family now. He's theirs. Christian, what do you look at when Satan tempts you to despair and tells you you're not a Christian, you're not a son, not a child of the living God? Well, you look here, the cross is your adoption certificate. It's the guarantee that you belong to God's family. If ever you doubt it, it's there. And it's not moving. The Lord Jesus is the guarantor of your adoption. The next color is violet. Purple. The color of royalty. And let's finally consider what the cross did for Christ. 
Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what we've got in mind as we read verse 9. Even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth under the earth and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our eyes have three types of color receptor cones and those cones enable us to see the, the colors that we see in the spectrum. Butterflies have five types of color receptor cones and so they see colors that we can't imagine and that we've never seen and couldn't even dream of. Now you and I have looked at the cross and we've seen seven reasons why the cross is central. That's not everything. Not by a long shot. And as we learn to see more with the eyes of faith, as we grow as Christians, we're going to see more and more. John Piper's got a little book, 50 Reasons Why Jesus Had to Die. And, and that will continue to expand as we understand more and more of what God achieved at Calvary. But there is one who sees every reason. There is one who has unlimited spiritual color receptor cones to see exactly what is going on there. And that is God. He's the only one who understands the cross fully. And his reaction to it, his response, in full knowledge of what's going on there, is to give Jesus the highest place over all things. In, in legends, Arthur became king of England because he proved himself worthy by pulling the sword from the stone. Christ has proven himself worthy as the king of the cosmos by living and dying to fix this broken relationship between man and God. He has bridged a seemingly impossible divide. And now the Father says to Jesus, your work's done. It is finished. No more pain. No more suffering. Sit at my right hand and reign as king. And so the cross is central for many, many reasons. And we rejoice in all the things that it does for us. And those in turn help us to see Christ more clearly. But ultimately it stands there at the center of our faith. Because it proclaims unequivocally Christ is King. That's what it stands to say to us today. Jesus is glorious. And that's something that has happened whether you believe it or not. Two girls took the trip to Paris, and I've told you about this before. They went to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa. And they were there standing on the edges of the big crowd, a bit like Zacchaeus trying to get a look. And they could see the painting and all these tourists gathering around trying to see it. And, and one said to the other one, I don't know what the fuss is about, it's not that great. And the security guard stood next to them who they didn't realize was there said, no, madam, you don't judge the Lisa, she judges you. And what he meant by that was the judgment's already been made about the Mona Lisa. For centuries, critics have said, masterpiece. And so da Vinci, the artist, genius. And so what you think about the Mona Lisa says a lot less about the Mona Lisa than what it says about you and your ability to see and your ability to judge. Now I'm saying to you this morning that the judgment on the cross has been made. The one who sees it emphatically, clearly, says masterpiece of redemption. And so Jesus is declared to the universe as Lord of all. What you say about Jesus this morning says less about him than it does about you. It's not too late to pray and ask, open the eyes of my heart. Let me see something of what you see, God, in Jesus. Help me to see something that I might value his person and his cross work. Now, if you are a Christian and you're sat there saying that, hey, I do see something of the, the value of the cross. I see that Jesus is Lord of all. 
Well, your life has got to change. You think God looks at the cross and He does something. He gives Jesus the place that is above all. Have you really done that? And are you doing that in your heart? See, it's not enough to say Jesus is Lord with words and not with actions. Jesus said there are going to be many who go to hell saying, Lord, Lord. Your, your life has got to be saying, Lord, Lord. If there's any reality to that, what you're claiming in your heart, it's got to be shown in your life. You must live like Jesus is Lord. Now, how do we do this? Well, on a Middle Eastern beach, February 12, 2015, 21 men were not rescued from ISIS. 21 Coptic Egyptian Christians were beheaded on a beach. Why? Because they were people of the cross. That was the problem. That was what was wrong with them in the eyes of their captors. They were people of the cross. And I'm saying to us in light of what we've heard these last two Sundays, this is what we must be. People of the cross. This is the badge of honor that I long for all of you to own. That you might not be first Presbyterian or Baptist or Dispensationalist or Calvinist or Arminian, but before anything known here and to the world as people of the cross. Now, what does that mean practically? One, it means we are always looking at and never tiring of hearing about Calvary. We're going to insist it's here every week. I want the cross in every sermon and I want it in the hymns I'm singing and I want to see it wherever I'm reading in Scripture. Show me something of Jesus' dying love either being pointed to, pointed back to or clearly revealed in front of me. We're always looking with that as our focus point. Secondly, we allow what we see as we look to so influence and affect our lives that this vision as we gaze at the Lamb of God dying to take away the sins of the world that we allow ourselves to be so changed by it that from now on we live every day in light of what Jesus did when he showcased his glory, grace and love to the world at Calvary. And so we need to get into this pattern where we even get to a point where the first thought in our heads when we wake up in the morning is what must I do, to the, to do today in light of Calvary? How must I think and live Monday morning in light of what Jesus has done? How must I speak to those around me? How am I going to arrange my farm or my week or my hobbies or my friendships so that I can just avoid uh, not living this truth? How can I do this in a way that I can't get away from this reality of showing my self-sacrificing servant, saviour, king to those around me? How can I bring that to bear on my world in, in the everyday things that I'm doing? And then how can I suffer? Even that, even those things that I don't like doing, how can I do those for the glory of God? How can I spend and be spent in a way that pays honour to the one who gave everything for me? And how can I sacrifice in a way which will make others look to the cross of Christ and see the things that I see? I've been challenging us about the questions and the way that we talk to each other after church on Sunday morning and Sunday evening. I've been asking us, you know, what are we, what are we saying to each other? Here's a question to ask each other. How have you been living? You don't have to be bold and be brave. Go up to a Christian friend. How have you been living this week in light of the cross? And this week... We'll fudge our answers. And you ask again next week, what's changed? What's different? And we keep asking until it changes, until we see that growth and that fruit being born out in our lives. Fanny Crosby has that beautiful hymn, Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain flows to all a healing stream down from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. What's the answer to our indifference and lack of enthusiasm? What's going to heat up our lukewarmness? What's going to reignite you smoldering wicks? Jesus, keep me near the cross. All our fruitfulness, our happiness stems from this place. Let's pray.